بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. We begin the name of Allah, all praise and glory be to Allah, and may His finest peace and blessings be upon His Messenger Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and his family and his companions and all those who tread his path. <coughs> so they asked me to speak on who is Allah. And obviously if this was like an Islam 101 for a, a non-Muslim audience, the answer would be very different. And so I'm not really going to speak about introducing new information to you about Allah, new data, right? As much as I wish to probe the issue of how much depth do we have in our knowledge about Allah on an experience level? You know, two uh, specialists in, in the psych space, Dr. Usman Umarji and Dr. Hassan Alwan, who are directors and researchers at Yaqeen Institute, for the last eight or ten years, and publications are forthcoming, inshallah, even before Yaqeen actually uh, was founded, they've been working specifically on what are known in the psych space as God image studies. And so God image studies are really about like how you perceive that spiritual being, the almighty, the supreme being. And they found that there could even be, among Muslims we're talking about, some pathology here, like one out of every five Muslims, roughly speaking, has an unhealthy spiritual perception of Allah Azza wa Jal. And those who don't have it on a pathological level, like a very debilitating level, many of them have a very dangerous imbalance at least, at least in how they see Allah Tabaraka wa Ta'ala. So for instance, the way they see Him at heart, right, creates for them what they call anxious attachment. An anxious attachment to Allah Azza wa Jal that's, that's correlated, either caused by or causes or a little bit of both, right? Low self-esteem, the sense of shamefulness, the sense of not being lovable. And I experience this on an anecdotal level all the time in the da'wah space, and I'm sure many can relate that are involved in this line of work. In fact, there is a, a, a screenshot that I cyclically read year after year of a sister who said that her spiritual anxieties reached to such a point that when she got to the Kaaba for the first time in her life, she had so much she wanted to say to Allah, but she couldn't just stop crying in front of the Kaaba and saying, are you still mad at me? Please love me, right? And it's very heart-wrenching, but let us not use the most you know, extreme examples, though they exist. Maybe one out of five of us could be experiencing this. You can actually see this yourself. You need not trust us, the preachers and the educators. Dr. Osman himself, actually, one of these two researchers on the God image studies, he says, I have a halaqa that I teach of preteen girls, seven of them. I asked each of them to write down the three top words that come to mind when I say Allah. And so they wrote 21 qualities of Allah Azza wa Jal. Mighty, all-seeing, everywhere, mysterious, none of them mentioned love, right? None of them mentioned mercy. And so if you ask any Muslim, this is the point of the depth of your knowledge of Allah, how deep and how balanced and how aligned is it with the way Allah introduces himself to us, with the way Allah wants you to perceive him. No Muslim that you ask is going to give you any terrible descriptions of Allah Azza wa Jal. But the proportionality. Many people, they see Allah, if I can use the term, in the police image, right? Just hovering, uh, enforcing, and nothing more. Very few, too few of us at least, see Allah Azza wa Jal in the protective, caretaking, nourishing, loving, defending supreme being. And you can't really test this with others because it's hard to, to flesh it out on many levels, even for a researcher. But we should all constantly be asking ourselves, how much security do I feel out of my belief in Allah? How much do I trust Him? How much do I trust His plans? How much do I trust His laws? You know, without knowing the name of the person flying that plane, 
or the boat, <laughs> if you ride ships, right? You sort of trust the process. Their drive-in's fine. They must be authorized, certified, right? So how can our lives, anxiety and stressors are normal and a part of it and a means of elevation if used correctly. But how many of our lives are riddled with anxieties and insecurities despite the fact that we know Allah's driving? Allah is in charge of our lives, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do we find this profound empowerment from it and security in it? You know, I often think about Sa'id ibn Jubair, who was not just arrested, he was ultimately executed by Al-Hajjaj. And Al-Hajjaj basically told him, you're still like being lippy here, <laughs> like you're still being brazen. The executioner's on his way. My life, your life is in my hands, he told him. And so Sa'id ibn Jubair, you know, he's a great imam of the Tabi'een, met many of the Sahaba. He said, if I actually believed that, if I believed that my life was in your hands, I wouldn't worship anybody but you. Like, hey, don't get it twisted. You're not my God. Don't get confused because I certainly am not. Right? Even though he was executed, he said, Allahumma inni as'aluka husna dhanni bik, sudqa tawakkuli alayka husna dhanni bik. Oh Allah, even in this final moment, grant me good assumptions of you always and proper reliance on you always. Such empowerment, such fearlessness, regardless of what, what life throws at you. You know what Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, for example, he says, uh, what can my enemies ever do to me when my garden is within my chest? You can't access my inner peace. You can't rob me of it. Wherever I go, it's with me. He said, you kill me, it's a, I'm a martyr. You throw me in prison, I have some privacy with Allah. It's like i basically, right? Finally get some seclusion. He says, you exile me, it is a devotional journey. Like Hajj is a little bit inconveniencing for Allah's pleasure, I'll take it. In other words, joke's on you. You can't hurt me because I have Allah and my sense of security is grounded in Him. Like, do we find this? Like, you know the, the, the wife of Abu Ubaidah in a beautiful story that time will not allow for me to tell, actually. Uh, Umar radiallahu an says to her, لَأَسُوا naki, You're going to be sorry for what you did. He thought that she was sort of like materialistic, shopaholic, and was pressing her husband, Abu Ubaidah, one of the ten promised Jannah, to use his governorship to get some sort of concessions, right? To see it as a privilege, not a responsibility. So he came and he told her, you're going to be sorry for what you've been doing. And so she said, you will not be able to make me sorry. And so her husband steps in and says, no, 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 he can't. Because <laughs> if Umar can't make you sorry, then who's going to be able to make you sorry? Especially when Umar is Khalifa now. He could do it before he was even Muslim. He can make people sorry. And she says, he will never be able to make me sorry. And then she explained why. She said, can he strip my Islam from me and toss it aside? So her husband said, no. She said, then he can't do anything to me. I don't care what he does after that. So long as I'm a servant of Allah, I'm unbreakable. That's what gives me value. That's what gives me security. That's what gives me empowerment. You know, to walk flashing that passport. Some people love to flash the U.S. passport. They feel secure from it. Because the gov this government across the ocean has a strong military force and it will ask about me, right? The believer in Allah flashes that I'm the servant of God. So how much does a person feel a sense of security, sense of trust, sense of empowerment from their belief? That's what we want to ask about. Let me ask another question. How much do you feel, once again, experience Allah's closeness, His nearness, His forgiveness or His care? His love, subhanahu wa ta'ala, for you. Like, do you feel, I know you know it, but do you feel, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِي عَنِّي Allah initiates, and when my servants ask you about me, I am near. He's the one initiating it. Do you feel when Allah says, مَنْ عَادَ لِي وَلِيًّا فَقَدْ آذَنْتُهُ بِالْحَرْبِ Whomever, you know, shows animosity towards those close to me. And every believer on some level is a wali, is close to Allah. Or else he wouldn't have given you faith. He wouldn't have given you belief. Whoever shows animosity, enmity to those close to me, I've declared war on that person. Allah declares war in defense of you. You know, actually, the, the, the end of that very famous hadith says, وَمَا تَرَدَّدْتُ فِي شَيْءٍ أَنَا فَاعِلُ And I, Allah, never regret anything I do the way I regret pulling my believing servant's soul who hates death and I hate to hurt them. You know, Allah doesn't hesitate the way we hesitate. Allah is not like us. We hesitate because we're not sure of the outcomes. 
But sometimes also we hesitate because we're sure of the outcome, but we wish the medicine wasn't as sour, right? So Allah is saying, I'm not indifferent about like whether it hurts you or not, you sink or you swim. Or, no, no. Allah is saying, the only thing I hesitate about is putting my servant through death because I don't like. It's a hesitation from dislike. But for the greater wisdom, he does it. He puts you to death to give you a better world. But just notice that, that he hesitates even putting us to death, putting us through hardship. Because he hates to harm you, hates to annoy you. <clears throat> and there are so many ayat that you think, where did all this go in my experience with Allah? You know, speaking of indifference, Allah Azza wa Jal says also, ما يفعل الله بعذابكم What would Allah do with punishing you? It's not like it's all on you, you do it or you don't. No, Allah has a preference. He has a preference not to punish. He prefers to forgive. He loves to, to overlook. He loves to pardon. He loves to rescue and save. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or the last ayah I will, I will cite in this regard, you know, about experiencing his love, feeling his care, his concern for you, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is the, the very famous ayah, what many scholars call like the most hope-filled ayah in the Qur'an. قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ Say to them, I want them to know, say to them, O Muhammad, O my servants who have crossed every limit. So you've crossed every bound, you've broken the laws and then broken your promises to not break the laws and you've done it over and over who've crossed every bound you're still my servants i haven't disowned you yet he still says ya ibadi oh my servants and then he says who have crossed all limits against themselves he's trying to tell you not trying that's inappropriate term with allah maybe right he wants you to know that by the way you didn't hurt me ala anfusihim You've hurt yourself. Don't worry, you didn't hurt me. You're still my servant and you didn't hurt me. Let the one thing you do correctly be that you never lose hope in my mercy, in my forgiveness. Allah forgives it all. He is forgiving, He is merciful, the ayah ends by saying. So, how much of that, what's the proportion of that in our experience, experiential knowledge with Allah wa ta'ala? How much time do I have, by the way? Where's the organizers? 10 minutes. Okay, cool. So, <clears throat> I, I want to mention two major points really in these 10 minutes. Focusing on what psychology today calls our God image is something inherently Islamic, right? It's thinking about how you think about God, right? Is something inherently Islamic. Didn't, didn't the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam say ana, that Allah said ana inda dhanni abdi bi. I am what my servant thinks of me so you have to consider how you think of him like how do you see Allah not just the theoretical of course like Lan rabbakum hatta tamutu. we have to always put that disclaimer out there uh, you will never see your Lord visually eyesight wise until you die it's clear Prophet Sallam said that no one should ever doubt this right but seeing his image, right? Meaning with your heart, with your insight, not your eyesight. This is something very possible that you need to see it. It has to be a real visual. I'm not saying it has any one form. I don't want to turn this into like a, a, a theological discussion that has to get crude and austere. But when the Prophet ﷺ said, رَأَيْتُ رَبِّي فِي أَبْهَى صُورَةً that I was permitted to see my Lord in the most marvelous image. That doesn't mean the true image, the great image that, you know, the believers get to see that's reserved for the believers on the day of judgment, but he shows you an image of himself, right? You perceive him a certain way. And there, there's so many examples of this. I mean, it is reported Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah, and Al-Awza'i, and so many others, you say, I see, I saw Allah in my sleep. I believe it was Imam Al-Awza'i, rahimahullah. He said, I saw my Lord in my sleep, and I said to him, Ya Rabb, let me die upon Islam. And so he said to me, and the sunnah. Say, and the sunnah. Islam and the right mark within Islam. The way of the Prophet والسلام, And Imam Ahmad, through his ordeal, used to say, he's seen his Lord time and time again in his sleep, and that's what got him through it. And so seeing your Lord with your heart is something we should be thinking about. And thinking about how to build it. Not just, oh man, I guess I'm one of those people who has like an unhealthy perception of Allah. No, no, no. 
you know, when the God image studies come out, they're very prominent, by the way, in, in, in Christian psych literature. But the two researchers I started this talk speaking about, they actually have, have used what the dean taught us and tried it in their practices, and it has been extremely therapeutic for people. You know, basically, you can even self-treat yourself on some level. Like, how do I build it right? How do I customize? What is my, like, deficiency, and how do I balance that out? Because it could be different for different people. Got you. I'll remember, inshallah, I promise. Uh, even though you stole a minute from me, but who's counting? Uh, I'm joking, I'm joking. You're fine. Uh, and so, it comes from two places. Keep that in mind. It comes, yes, through the data, through the information, and that's a big deal because there's so much information that will ruin your God image when you live in a society that is anti-religious. Or if us preachers aren't doing the best job in the world and we're speaking too negatively or too much of the haram, too much law, not enough love, that, that could be an imbalance. Even Ibn al-Qayyim complained of this imbalance in preachers a thousand years ago. So it, it, we could, we're human, we could fall into it. We are products of culture as well, right? And so more of the do's and don'ts than the actual, like, fruitful, invigorating doctrines of the deen, this is a problem. Anyway, so the information, you've got to adjust it. But also your experiences, you need some closure on them. Why do I feel this way? Like many a times, these researchers found that sometimes it is a negative self-image that you develop for whatever reasons. Sometimes it's also a trust issue that you have with parents that you then project it on Allah Azza wa Jal, or low self-esteem for whatever other reason you have, and you say, oh yeah, I'm unworthy of being forgiven. Well, Allah never said that. You saw yourself that way, and then you projected it on Allah. And so the information and the experiences, that combination is what creates your God image, and so you need to be careful with that and build it accordingly. Because it is the lens through which you're going to process everything else. You know, I'll give you a quick example. If, if people don't trust a very, you know, far example. Trust Allah whatsoever. He's not really God or he's not really there. Or he's not, he doesn't really know. If you don't believe that he knows or knows the wisdom, you will not go looking for the wisdom, right? Everything else will be like, yeah, let me figure out another explanation. So why do we have organs that we don't know their function? Allah knows best. If I can't Set, sit with Allah knows best, I don't have that kind of confidence in Him, then I'll look for another explanation. Oh, the evolution thing must have been true, right? By the way, there was a huge list of organs that were leftovers from the evolutionary days about a hundred years ago, and the list continues to shrink. The vanishing proofs of evolution. It continues to, by the way. And people's confidence in that theory continues to be rattled. But we don't need to wait for that. And people's lifetimes aren't long enough for that. Develop your knowledge of Allah because it is your greatest treasure to stay on faith here and, and survive in the hereafter, but also not just the greatest treasure for the akhirah. Your knowledge of Allah is your greatest source of pleasure in this world. You know Ibn al-Mubarak, when he used to say, masakinu ahli dunya, these, he's sympathizing, like these poor people that are obsessed with the material world and material pleasures, like they live such shallow lives. He says they waste their life without tasting the most pleasurable thing, most delicious thing in life. They said, what's that, O Imam? He said, Ma'rifatullah, being acquainted with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and, you know, being acquainted with Allah, I have three minutes left, is the objective, <laughs> is so important, it's the objective of the universe. Like, can you imagine? Allah says He created the seven heavens, the last verse in Surah Talaq, seven heavens and seven earths, and sends his commands down between them. All that why? What's the whole point of the universe? لِتَعْلَمُوا أَنَّ اللَّهَ So that you may know about Allah, X, Y, and Z. So be thoughtful about his universe. See his names and his attributes. Develop that skill through his universe. As one of those two researchers, Dr. Hassel Alwan, once said to us in a beautiful reminder, if I pulled out of this piece of wood, I don't know if this is real wood or not, but if this piece of wood, I pulled out of it an apple, would you be blown away or not? You'd be blown away. You'd say it's a miracle or a magic trick or something. So why don't we consider it a magic trick or a miracle when apples come out of the wooden branch? Because we're just not being thoughtful, right? You're not trying to see that. You're not looking for that. That was the point of the universe. So don't be heedless about that. And last but not least, and there's no time to explain it, if we do this, we prioritize and invest in reintroducing Allah to ourselves, 
the way he said, the way he wants. One of the greatest signs of this is that it will generate love above all. Love for Allah above all else. Because think about it. If your purpose in life is ibadah, ibadah, the word ibadah, there's 60 words in the Arabic language, by the way, for love, for loving, degrees of loving something or someone, the highest of them is called ibadah. And so if you were created to love, then Allah sent for you a Qur'an and described himself to you in a way that would bring you there above all else, bring you to loving him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like, وَهُوَ الْغَفُورُ الْوَدُودِ He is the forgiving, the loving, the sister began with, right? Anybody else you wrong, or if someone wrongs you, and they're close, you know, uh, to you, the betrayal is very hard to forgive. And then if you years later have that amazing ability to forgive them, you're still going to be like, but I can't really love them like before. Yet Allah is saying the moment you make amends with Him, every person on earth, no matter what they do, not only will I forgive them, I will love them even more than before. Should a God like that not be loved, subhanahu wa ta'ala? And the examples are many, but just look out for it. It should generate love above all. That should be the balance. It's not like 20% love and 20% fear and 20% hope. And no, the dominant emotion we should have for Allah, Quran-centric narrative, is that love. May Allah fill our hearts with his love. Say ameen. And the love of all that he loves. And the love of every action that would bring us closer to his love. Allahumma ameen. Barakallahu feekum wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka wa nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.